So Naveen, maybe you want to take over? Yeah, yeah I think uh, we are well in time. So we can take uh, about eight minute break and then come back at uh, 15.30 Eastern time. Um, so in about eight minutes uh, for the interactive Q&A with the speakers. Perfect. So we'll be back in eight minutes.
hello Jan. Uh, we are just on a break we'll be starting the q a session in a minute in one minute uh, are you able to hear me okay perfect yeah great nice to see you Okay, we are back. Uh, maybe just a minute before everyone gets back. And we can begin the interactive Q&A session. And as you can see in the chat and on the screen here, uh, the link towards the Google document, which has collated all the questions during the session uh, has been posted. So you could go through the questions or if you prefer, you can directly address the speakers during the interactive session. Uh, a small note, there is no real time limit uh, on a certain speaker's talk. So go ahead uh, with a more open, open-ended uh, form of questioning. But uh, keep in mind that we do have one hour for this session, for the interactive Q&A session. So maybe we can begin. Uh, Naveen, you're there? Yeah, I'm there. Uh, maybe you can start with the, the Google Doc. Okay, perfect. So, so like, should we go through, like, speaker-wise? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, okay, um, so maybe we can just reiterate some of the things which were answered in the chat itself for some of the people who joined much later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a good idea to switch on the video. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the first one is for Renaud uh, from Edward. Uh, which handcrafted features did you use to encode the segments? Yes, yeah, so we used ensemble of shape features and also a cleat, so eigenvalue-based features. They work quite Familiar, quite can you describe a little bit the ensemble of shapes features? Yes, yeah, so basically, um, I don't remember the dimension, but I, if I recall correctly, it's something like 10 histograms of different um, statistics. For example, you pick three points in the point cloud and you look at the angle, or you, put, you pick two points at random and you look at the distance. Um, it's a composition of such geometric features. 
Merci. Thank you. And it was a bit more expensive than the eigenvalue based ones. I mean, quite a bit more expensive. And in the end, we ended up using only the eigenvalue based ones for the when we use like much afterwards. Okay. Um, the the next question we have is from Xia Ying. Uh, it's it's about the how the occupancy grid is is updated if uh, the objects just move away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in this work, we did not do any raycasting. So the goal was not here to have a dense representation, uh, like an actual dense representation of the environment. It was mostly about the loop closures. And in that case, we or realized, experimented quite a bit in environments where there were firemen around the robots moving. And that in the, the end works still nicely. But of course, this representation is not um, made strictly for super dynamic environments. But I think it could be possible to adapt this. Um, the code is open source if you want to take a look. Yeah, cool. Um, I think next is Ravi. Yeah, sorry. So the question was uh, regarding the feature extraction. So. Uh, the idea was to understand how much of an effect the resolution of the leader has on the feature extraction. For example, if you had a VLP 16, 32, or a higher resolution leader on different agents, uh, would the feature still be stable so that you can perform better localization? Mm -hmm. um, as I insert shortly, I mean, if you want to use completely different lighters with completely different reading patterns. In that case, it might be better to have this integrated point cloud because if you're lucky enough, then you will move the robot and you will create this dense, recon dense representation. And from this, you can hope that the segments extracted will be similar for the different hmm. uh, sensors. If you have something, uh, two, two lighters, for example, VLP32 and VLP16, what we did is don't scale uh, it to a VLP 16. Uh -huh. That was a one shot uh, technique. And this worked actually quite nicely. So we we're positively surprised when we got the first results. I see. So, have maybe like a smaller extension of a question, of the same question. Mm -hmm. so what happens if you have multiple leaders on a single agent? Uh, mm -hmm. When the, the idea is you would get a different scanning pattern and a different type of. Uh, point cloud output. So would this also affect your feature extraction? Yeah, so I guess you would have to potentially retrain the network um, and also the, the segmentation part. I have one colleague who did kind of this multi-sensor, so generating one cloud from multiple sensors, and then we could virtually move uh, the position of the sensor on the vehicle and then I you get different reading patterns. But yeah, I guess you would need to re or take another look into the segmentation and description. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, I think the next question, I forgot who asked it. What happens for these localization systems if the 3D maps have many similar areas? Mm -hmm. I think that's My question. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Challenge for all, let's say, 3D point cloud based localization system. Um, if you cannot use appearance or if you don't have specific cues, this can be very challenging. So, do you try to address uh, this problem or not really? I mean, do you have a strategy? So we do have, yeah, actually we did, um, because one in one of the search and rescue experiments that we did, there were these tiles at the um, ceiling, which were all over in the same configuration, all over the building. And then we could basically loop close everywhere. So we added a small trick where we would look at the configuration. And if, when you get these, let's say square, configuration of the correspondences, then we would require more matches before outputting a localization. 
So this is one okay. one trick that we added on top. But yeah, obviously this is a hard challenge. Do you think this could be addressed by outputting some probabilistic? Uh, you know, like say there is some probabilities that you may be in each possible place that matches. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a way, we, we have at the last, as the last uh, module of the system, we had this geometric consistency test. And this one often outputs different localizations. Um, sometimes they are actually all in the same area, but let's say you have five or six correspondences which give you one transformation and then five or six others which give you another transformation which is very similar. Mm. Um, so then we always took the one with the most correspondences, but of course you could do something more advanced there. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I have one question about the projection that you had from leader to camera. Um, I think it was in the second half of the talk. Uh, so here, do you make use of uh, some sort of dynamic calibration or is it always statically calibrated that you use? Because sometimes the, the projection can be erroneous. Yep. Um, for, for this work, it was static. It was static. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Obviously. Also there you could investigate, get further, but this was work from Sebastian who did, was doing a master thesis with us at mm -hmm. that time. So we tried to focus a bit uh, the work. Yeah, in our works, like here, when we uh, are also using uh, projections, we found some, uh, sometimes the error just accumulates so much that, yeah, it starts drifting. So we, we had to account for that. So that's why I had this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, um, maybe uh, then we can move on to the next uh, speaker. Um, Aaron Miller is with us. Uh, hi, I think very hi. early there, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, that's super early. Uh, we have a question from Pinar Boyras Bekas. Um, have you considered any intent recognition or anticipatory predictions for the surrounding vehicles uh, when you lose the measurements? Yeah, um, yeah, this is something we thought about. Um, yeah, so right now we're kind of using we're using an EKF with like a standard. Um, vehicle dynamics model and Gaussian process noise um, for doing our predictions. Um, but there's a lot of, there's been a lot of interesting work um, kind of in the single vehicle case on predicting um, what vehicles around you are going to do in the future. Um, so we've, um, I mean, it seems like it should be, um, it should be possible to take predictions from such a system. Um, like the level four vehicle, um, could maybe be expected to be running such a system already um, as part of its own autonomy stack. Um, so it certainly, it seems reasonable to maybe take distributions of over possible trajectories coming out of that prediction system and use those um, instead of like a vehicle model with Gaussian process and noise, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it is, it is something we've thought about, um, not something that we've uh, experimented with yet. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, so I had a question too. So, so in, in your talk, you presented uh, two types of fusion, one for the obs ob obstacle detection and tracking and the other for the localization. And I uh, was wondering if there was a coupling uh, assumed between the two systems because finally the location of your obstacle is in your global frame or do you assume it to be in the local frame only? Yeah, um, so the, yes, the perception stuff operates in a global frame. Um, the localization stuff um, does kind of account for uncertainty in the, um, the um, vehicle positions in the global frame. Um, so you're right that there's kind of, there's, a little bit of uh, different reasoning there between the perception and localization systems. Um, we don't um, we don't reason exactly, um, like in the perception system. We don't reason about what the localization system is doing, um, and vice versa. Um, but yeah, that could be an interesting extension um, to incorporate those together. 
um, I have one question. So in, in your uh, matching algorithms, uh, as well as uh, for computing this fuse localization error, do you take into account uh, whether it's an L2 system or an L4 system? Because L4 has more precise sensors and L2 has, uh, yeah, the accuracy is lower, like, uh, like you showed in the, in the images. Uh, but do you also take into account this information um, as a prior in, for some sorts? Yeah, so um, in the, well, really in, every, in all of our measurements that we're using, um, we have these, I mean, we have these covariances that we, we're using, and then we have this false negative probability that we're using. Um, and those do depend on which vehicle is making the measurement, whether it's an L2 vehicle or an L4 vehicle. Um, so yeah, there, there's a significant difference there um, based on which vehicle it is. Um, uh, but could it be that for an L2, uh, you have measurements such that um, the covariances are like smaller and then it's a bit uh, confusing if it's from L4 or L2? It, de it depends on the number of measurements you have, I guess. I guess I don't, I don't totally follow. Um... So I guess the question is, uh, if an L2 system has a more precise estimate of your localization, than an L4 system because over time maybe the L4 has a more imprecise localization. Sorry, instantaneously has a imprecise localization, but on average it's good. While L2 could be instantaneously better than the L4, but on average it's poorer than the L4. Or L2, oh, sorry, poorer than the L4. Was sure. Right? Um, yeah. So we don't do anything to we don't do anything to like estimate uncertainties of individual measurements online. Um, or that kind of thing, um, but you could um, you could imagine doing something like that. Um, we kind of assume they're they're constant across time. Um, yeah. Okay, I see. Cool. Thank you. I um, have a question as well. So, uh, in your presentation, there was this uh, matching procedure that you presented with, I think, the Hungarian algorithm. Um, my question is, are there cases where you think that uh, there could be a, a mismatch, which in turn uh, would degrade the performance of the, the sensor fusion? So for example, if, if a vehicle sees uh, another vehicle which is not perceived by, uh, so if L2 sees a vehicle which is not seen by L4, which attributes it to something else, could that degrade the overall performance? Yeah. Um, yeah, and in fact, that's the um, that's the kind of main limiting factor um, in the performance of the system um, is kind of wrong associations. Uh, um, so we've looked at um, yeah. I mean, we've looked at kind of adding additional features um, to make that more robust, um, appearance-based features, um, and uh, I mean, there are lots of methods for um, in kind of like single vehicle multi-target tracking. Um, there are lots of methods for um, making that association um, less ambiguous. Um, so so kind of does, it tend to, does it tend to happen a lot in your simulations or is it uh, already quite robust? It, um, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, it happens, um, yeah, it, it didn't happen a lot, um, okay. which was kind of reflected in, um, in the um, numbers that we, um, like the the average error and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, yeah. But of course, there's there's kind of a long tail of um, of these uh, situations you want to consider and possible misassociations. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. So next um, is uh, Professor uh, Garvis uh, in the call. Uh, sorry, I just had a really quick question before. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, have you have you have you probably considered uh, a tracking list that is actually available from uh, road infrastructure like uh, V2X or uh, perception systems which are just fixed on the road and would actually provide you uh, precise localization? Sorry, precise localization of the obstacles, not just because you don't get localized with this, but. Uh, I don't know if, if I was clear enough. So if you if you had a camera or if you had a leader on a pole, for example, 
uh, would the system still work? Yeah, um, we we haven't considered any like fixed road infrastructure uh, as part of the system. Uh, that's not really something that we've thought about. Um, it it seems like yes, um, you should be able to kind of incorporate that similarly um, into the system, but that's not something that we've uh, considered. Okay, um, next. I'm just checking if Professor Gavis is in the call. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, we can. Hi. Hi. Um, so the, the, the first question is uh, from Edward. Uh, maybe you can just, yeah, go ahead and ask it. Can you see me though? Uh, I cannot see myself. Uh, we can see your laptop uh, now, yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question is: uh, What is the benefit of using an exponential grid rather than a linear one? Um, exponential rather than linear grid. Um, is this uh, uh, somewhere um, in the papers? Uh, yes, was it seen I or described? I think there was one slide where you showed. Uh, a grid which was like this two to the power a this kind ah, of exponential right. repartition but also in other graphs you had linear grids so i don't really know right right doing. sorry uh, so uh, i think there was a, a confusion in the um, let ah. me go to the slide maybe I uh, there's probably a confusion from uh, uh, on my side uh, so i don't know if you have the slides or the video or if it really needs to be uh, shown but uh, this is not uh, an exponential grid this is the uh, you know the numbers that correspond to the weight right because uh, the um, uh, so I i'm logged in with my phone otherwise i would have um... <laughs> right so okay in, in this slide in this slide that you're uh, 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 we've got here so these grid points are actually uh, the uh, let's say the weight vocabulary so the vocabulary of numbers for uh, the weights and you know like this grid this vocabulary we initially define it to be two to the final zero to, to the bar one two three and so forth right and then uh, uh, with the scale parameter alpha we're modulating these uh, grid numbers so that they have more weight-like uh, values, right? So um, you can also think of uh, this grid can be just one, two, three, four, five. Uh, there is no uh, real difference. The scale parameter would, uh, uh, yeah, rescale things. I see, okay. Sorry for the confusion. Yes. Okay, um, I have one question uh, in the context of federated learning. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were to use this uh, quantization in, in um, like, let's say we have this teacher student model where like the edge devices, we have the student model uh, where we are computing the quantizations. How would the uh, kind of the global one work in, in this uh, uh, paradigm that you mentioned uh, in terms of updates uh, for quantization? Um, can, you, can you say it one more time? So we have this uh, global model for in, in the context of federated learning. Mm -hmm. um, and now you have also the local models on the edge devices. So if we have like uh, quantizations on the edge devices, um, mm -hmm. and that you mentioned ah, right. that thing, things are often lossy. I mean, it's lossy. So when mm -hmm. we are updating the global model, uh, how can we make it uh, efficient so that, you know, the 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 loss is minimal, or do you think uh, we need some sort of uh, different mechanism to to have these updates? Uh, this is a very interesting question that we have explored to some degree. There is no great answer to my knowledge at this, at this moment. So uh, then my answer would be more like, uh, you know, uh, the second option you provided that we have to think of something new. Uh, the problem is that uh, when you want to go to uh, federated learning, at least uh, if you want to do it in a, um, 
you know, in a hardcore manner, in a pure manner, where you're only exchanging exchanging uh, information, uh, you know, during training from the local devices to the server, then uh, you've got to uh, account for both the loss in the quantization as well as um, uh, uh, the problems that you have uh, with the uh, federation. Uh, I, I know that my answer is not uh, very specific right now, uh, but uh, um, uh, there is no uh, uh, obvious way how to improve on this. Like at least we couldn't find uh, something at the moment. So this is definitely a very interesting area for federated quantized uh, learning. It also makes uh, a lot of sense in my opinion, right? Because when you've got federation, you also it, it also usually means that uh, you have constraints in your uh, uh, devices. Um, right. So if I remember correctly, in general, in general with our experiments, uh, the standard federated learning where you're uh, communicating gradients and then sharing and then uh, combining was working really well uh, when you've got uh, basically um, uh, similar domain data, so uniform un uniform distribution over your data, uh, over all your devices. So then uh, a gradient, a local gradient could be pretty representative of the global population. However, when you were skewing things, when you were uh, assuming that each device has uh, uh, different uh, statistics, then things even in the purely federated setup were, um, you know, were more challenging. And we have um, an, a paper, actually submission on Europe for that. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, definitely when you've got uh, this joint setup of uh, you not know, having uh, uniform statistics uh, uh, in all devices and quantization, that's going to be hell. Uh, uh, when, yeah, whether you can actually combine quantization with uh, normal federation, I was originally proposed. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't really have an answer for that. Okay, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's a general question. So I was just curious how this can be used in, in this context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I mean, you can easily imagine that uh, instead of uh, sending uh, now weights or gradients, you can send uh, uh, you know, indices, like vocabulary indices uh, uh, around so that uh, to communicate much more efficiently uh, the changes. And then you can even uh, um, uh, imagine uh, that uh, uh, you can have like different levels of quantization or federation. So maybe uh, only the relevant devices uh, share bits or, or all the devices, or maybe also the, the server sends back uh, information. Well, obviously it all depends on the uh, final algorithm, but I think there's, I think federation quantization is like, uh, you have to do it in tandem one way or the other. It, it, uh, each in isolation has great problem, or not problem, but like great uh, um, uh, number of things that can be improved or you know issues. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, only in combination it makes uh, you know sense. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Stratus. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, is is Nadav in the call? I think we skipped Edward. So f first, Edward. Ah, sure. Sorry. Because I have both questions for Edward. Unless uh, if there are speakers who want to ask questions before, we don't want to hog the mic. So please go ahead if you have any questions. Well, I actually had a question for Edward. Uh, Edward, um, just in terms of the um, model that you're using for. Uh, for the risk, you showed it a lot with, with vehicles, and so so, so we, we have interest maybe in other areas, um, but maybe to try and keep it in an autonomous vehicle context. Have you ever thought about using these models for, for example, predicting the uh, behavior of pedestrians or other objects within the environment, or how, how complex is that? Do you need to know something about the under, underlying control, or is it is it more kind of open loop? Um. Basically, our works focus on how do you handle risk once you have already some description of uh, the, the uncertainty uh, in the environment. And there are a lot of other works which really focus on prediction, probabilistic okay. prediction, who would, uh, yes, have better models uh, for pedestrians and vehicles. And I guess the key challenge for us is to try to derive guarantees um, 
and for that you often need to make some uh, some assumptions on your dynamics and it can be quite constraining so in my case i worked on uh, this model based settings which uh, may not be the best for actually representing uh, the dynamics of a system because it's kind of constraining um yeah okay okay so you need yeah okay okay thanks yeah, maybe a model-free approach, uh, just fitting a data-driven deep model could uh, work better. And it's the, kind of the second aspect I presented. So maybe, Javi, I can answer also your questions. Sure. Um, ORT, it's, uh, I think it's a method which is mainly suited for uh, obstacle avoidance where you already know uh, your destination. And here the difference is that we don't really have a short term waypoint that we're trying to reach because we're actually uh, searching for this waypoint. Uh, it's kind of the role of the behavioral planning part where you don't know which lane you're going to end up with in uh, depending on the local configuration of the traffic. Hmm. And also they are based on, uh, this method is based on the fact that you can sample uh, some states nearby uh, any given state and you can also find a trajectory between any two closed states, which have to uh, comply with your dynamical model. So it's only possible if your dynamical model is simple, which may not be the fact, uh, may not be the case for uh, complex dynamics. And of course, yes, it's also not, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, it hasn't been extended to deal with uncertainty okay. and risk, uh, risk aware decision making. Thank you. And as of vehicle stability, sure. So there are several aspects you can be looking for. Uh, in our work, the vehicle dynamics has two parts. So one is the kinematics of the car. And the second is the behaviors of the drivers. And basically, we're saying that they don't behave uh, erratically. They're following some likely behavior, which is uh, following the lanes and braking if, uh, if someone is, uh, is in front. Mm -hmm. But we have some uncertainty around how they react. So let's say they are tracking uh, the center lane. Uh, they are going to have some uh, time constant on this controller, which is unknown at first. So we try to estimate it, basically their driving style. And so this, um, this is taken into account in our confidence ellipsoid and in the robust motion planning. And there are also some unmodeled effects that you could have. I don't know, the wind uh, on the car, basically. And this is modeled by uh, an unknown perturbation, which we just assume to be bounded. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Um, I have one question. So in, in your motion planning, uh, do you, uh, does the, uh, like you had static obstacles and dynamic agents, uh, which you were handling, um, how would we handle something like uh, traffic rules and uh, let's say we are approaching an exit, so the probability of a lane change gets higher, right? So such kind of constraints based on maps or traffic rules in, in your framework. Yeah, so you need to, I mean, so the traffic rules can, I think, be included pretty easily in the just the reward function, the cost function that is used to evaluate the trajectories. Um, the fact that the dynamics locally change because you're near an exit and vehicles which tend to change lane more easily. Um, so it might be more difficult to include in, a, especially if your model is constrained by your theory, as is our case. But um, it's also the case that we are doing uh, pessimistic reasoning and we're always assuming the worst possibility. So we are not really looking at the actual probabilities of outcomes, just the support of events that have a non-zero probability. So mm -hmm. basically, if you kind of always assume that there is some tiny probability that there can be an lane change, uh, um, the, the resulting behavior won't change if this probability augments a little bit. Okay, I see. But if you have a threshold, like you're only considering events that have uh, at least 1% chance of occurring, maybe you want not to consider this possibility uh, on the nominal highway driving, but mm -hmm. Whenever you get nearby an exit, then this probability increases and it goes over the below the threshold, and then you start uh, taking it into account for your decision making. Okay, yeah. so it's more dependent on how much data we have for that event. 
Mm. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions to Edward, then maybe let's move on to Nadav. Um, is he in the call? I don't see him. Uh, let me check. Maybe it was, I think the first question he already answered in the talk. I just spoke before the slide came up. And the second question was actually open. The only the question was basically to understand in a federated learning setup, could you actually have different architectures? Because you, we make an assumption that there is only a single model with the same architecture, in this case, uh, deep neural net architecture. Uh, but would it be possible to have something more heterogeneous? heterogeneous? Yeah. So I will ask him the question myself, posteriori. We can continue. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so then next is uh, Professor John McDonald. Um, yeah, first question is from Ravi, so you can you can just start. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the first question was around the number of cameras. So at the moment, the way we typically run it is we just start each each log independently. So because we're using this uh, lightweight communications and marshalling system, um, the kind of experimental setup is that we we capture what's effectively equivalent to a bag file for each camera. So LCM has a, an equivalent mechanism for capturing um, <coughs> uh, sensor data, which we can then run our experiments on. So each one of those is played back asynchronously or just um, in parallel, but there's, like I said uh, in, the, in the chat, there's, there's no global clock. Um, essentially how the system works is that the server is an LCM receiver that on each cycle of the mapping, it receives whatever frames have come in off the, um, the, the, the channels and it orders those <clears throat> in the order that they're received and then it processes them in a single uh, track and update step. So each, each camera is tracked and uh, fusion is performed uh, between them all. So, so <clears throat> in reality, I suppose you could have one camera that technically could be operating, at a, operating even at a different frame rate or starting at different times. So it's, it's quite decoupled from that point, which is, I suppose, a good thing. Um, but, but as I said, the talk this, there, the, we do still, we have kind of focused on one aspect of the problem without really paying too much attention that we haven't had the resources to kind of focus on the other aspect, which is the, uh, the efficiency of, of doing that. And um, so we, we have done some work around looking at information theoretic approaches for deciding when a particular frame should be fused or not, but we haven't integrated that yet into our multi-camera setting. So, so short answer is yes, that number of cameras could be changed dynamically. Uh, we haven't done it really yet, but there's nothing fundamentally in the algorithm that would stop that uh, or would preclude us from doing that. It's just a small extension. So, uh, I mean, the idea of adding a new camera within the same area of the other cameras would uh, would increase the yeah. of a loop closure, but what would happen if I have a camera which is arbitrarily arbitrarily sent to I don't know two, two three kilometers away with have which has no relation with the zone which is being mapped? Yeah, so in in that case, it will just be treated as an in independent camera. It will put an extra load on the system, I suppose, but um, you're, you're, it's it's not really advantageous. So I think that's that, that's an important question, and it, it kind of relates somewhat to Ronald's question. Um, so. Our work to date has really been focused on indoor mapping and more kind of close contact type scenarios. But I think in terms of moving to much larger scale scenarios, now we can do fairly lar large scale from an indoor mapping point of view, but in moving outdoors, one of the things we're thinking about is, is how you might use this as a front end to uh, where you would have a windowed mapping system, essentially a windowed uh, elastic fusion mapping system for each camera, which would then be, um, brought into global consistency using some kind of uh, sparse uh, back end or some, some kind of a pose graph representation. So even though Elastic Fusion, one of its strengths is to, to get rid of the uh, pose graph, I think uh, in outdoor scenarios, there's not really 
an advantage of a, of a vehicle or a robot maintaining this map over very, very large scales if it can be um, indexed back into the map uh, centrally. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so, so I, I know Raoul had asked a question um, about which back end we use um, for the intermap loop closures. So, um, yeah, so the, the, the because Elastic Fusion doesn't use a pose graph, which is kind of a quite a different approach to, to mapping, um, we don't use a pose graph either. So, so essentially what Elastic Fusion does is it, it embeds something called a deformation graph into the, um, into the map. So the, the surfle representation, sorry, the surfle map is decimated uh, in, a, in a kind of a uniformly sampled fashion uh, to create, so a, a set of, um, a sparse set of points are extracted and then a, a graphical structure is placed on top of that. And on each node, the deformation graph represents a transformation, a rigid body transformation from its current position to the target position. And that's what allows you, so when you get a loop closure, uh, the deformation graph is embedded across all parts of the map and uh, there's an optimization scheme then that will take the constraints from the loop closure system and compute a transformation on the deformation graph and that transformation results in what's known as a space deformation which is then applied to the map to bring the two maps into alignment and um, because it's it's a dense system that's operating at such a high frame rate um, I suppose what Elastic Fusion has kind of shown is is that maybe you don't need a pose graph um, you know, for, for uh, although we've all concentrated on that for, for quite a long time, but at least for, you know, in terms of these dense methods, uh, it's quite effective um, just using these um, deformation graph techniques. Um, yeah. Uh, if, if, uh... Oh, yes, the next one is, is it, if it's, so, yeah, so in actual fact, Ravi, when you asked this question, um, it hit me like a ton of bricks that I had actually omitted something in my slides when I talked about these surfle representations. Uh, so I, I mentioned what, what was stored in each surfle and then I, it just struck me that I had left out two very important parameters on my slides. So maybe I need to send some correction or something to be put on the YouTube video uh, before Tom Whelan rings me up angrily to, to complain about my error. So in, the, in each surfle we store the position, the normal, the color, the timestamps, but we also store a radius and a weight, right, which are extremely important. Uh, and, uh, it's embarrassing that I've left them out. So the weight and the radius are used in the fusion update step because the, the, the weight essentially gives us a, a measure of the confidence that we have in the current estimate. Um, and then the, the fusion update step was actually developed um, way back by Curlis and Levoy, I think in 1996, and was then used in things like uh, connect fusion and continuous and elastic fusion. And it's essentially a mechanism whereby you have like a running average or a weighted running average that you apply as new data comes in, you update, um, the current estimate by by a weighted average between the the current estimate and the uh, the, the new live data uh, based on your uncertainty on both. Um, so the two. So the, if you look at the Elastic Fusion paper, I think I put a link to it in the um, in the chat. You'll see the um, it's a very simple uh, update mechanism. But yeah. So so if you have in in standard Elastic Fusion, obviously you just have one measurement and the. Uh, the estimate, but in ours, then you just you, you're essentially running that fusion process multiple times in each loop. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one, one quick question. So you said, if I understood correctly, the let's say one camera in your work can close loop only against the in that inactive map of that own camera, and all the active maps of all cameras. Yes, that's that's right. So you don't really close a loop. So you don't close a loop, obviously, between yourself, your your own active area, and because you're tracking against that. But but yes. Yeah, so the it was actually when we started developing this. Initially, we thought this was going to be a simple problem, and then we started to realize, oh, there's a lot of engineering pieces to get this to work because these timestamps are assumed to monotonically increase across the map as you as you map. But now, when you introduce another camera, so there's kind of some implicit, implicit assumptions there that we found, uh, and and that's why we had to add this vector of timestamps because then, for each surfle, each camera can can kind of ask the question, when was the last time I saw that surfle? So even though a uh, a camera may be looking at an area that you want to loop close against, it will be updating that surfle uh, at the current point in time. But that might be, it might be quite a while since another camera has seen that surface. So you can still loop close into those and you can get loop closures between uh, two active 
areas of the map, which um, actually, yeah, so, so, the, so we have some demos of that in, in our other paper that kind of show, show some of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this I also found to be a challenge, this engineering behind just what you mentioned. So I was wondering how that- Yeah, so, 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 so often you can ask a simple question and it, <laughs> it's very difficult to answer it when you start trying to implement some of these things. Uh, uh, yeah. okay. Or at least that's what my PhD student tells me. <laughs> <laughs> Cesar says hi, by the way. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, tell him I said hello. Uh, I will. I will. Um, so I think that the next question was from Edward, which was kind of both to myself and Renaud uh, around um, whether we've looked at the. So we haven't actually looked at exploration either, right? So, so I suppose the when you say it's a fixed. Uh, um, Fixed trajectory actually is the is the question something I think the question had dropped. I recall you you have some data set of, of already existing acquisitions and you don't uh, optimize uh, which yeah, parts so, of the so, yeah. so, so so the trajectories are kind of pre-specified in the mm -hmm. in the in the data set, but obviously of course um, they are estimated then by by the algorithm. So the algorithm doesn't yeah. know the, the trajectory, but yes, you're right. The um, trajectories are pre-specified and even when we run it on our you know a, a live robot we don't um uh, yeah we don't close the loop there in terms of trying to figure out which way we should move so you manually control on. the robots uh, so yes yeah, so we might manually control the robots or, or or even if if it was autonomous maybe the objective of the robot is not specifically to um maximize the coverage maybe it's doing something else and then and and essentially the the mapping process and the localization process kind of sits passively behind that trying to integrate the information but i think i think the problem of kind of a, it's, it's normally referred to as active vision where you're trying to actively decide which way should i turn to mm. to maximize the information content um you know andrew davison himself and his phd did a lot of work on that uh, we haven't done much on it so i can't really speak to the the problem but i know renaud has um Posted a link from Luigi Frida, which looks like some very interesting work around yeah. that. Area. So I had a quick look at, uh, at this work, and from what I understood from just the abstract, they are basically um, looking to avoid conflicts and deadlocks between multiple robots. And so it's a general multi agent uh, planning problem. I was wondering if there were also more specific uh, requirements due to this uh, vision based localization. So, for instance, um, you have these uh, settings where multiple robots uh, gather data and they build their own maps. And when they meet, you do this uh, loop closure. And I guess that it uh, it improves the accuracy of the estimates of both cameras. Is it the case, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that might be something which could be optimized for uh, in the exploration process. Like the robots could maybe try to schedule to meet from time to time to make sure everything is consistent and accurate. Uh, I don't know if it's realistic or if it's not really uh, needed and everything is just going to work uh, if we don't consider this explicitly. I don't know if that's to me or to you, Renaud. Um, so so <laughs> in my, my, my perspective is yes, it is a very useful thing to be able to do to, to, to you know, when you close a loop, you correct for global consistency typically um, mm. in a dense mapping system you can also close you know correct for local consistency because typically with this fusion process it's capable of handling handling dynamics in the map either uh, in a kind of an open loop fashion where you um, you know if something is on a table and it moves the fusion process will kind of dissolve that off the table as it gets more and more measurements um, so so it's it's useful from that perspective to 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 be able to do that. So it's certainly something you could schedule into a planning system to to do something like that. If I okay. remember correctly, in the paper you mentioned, John, this SID and all the GFR paper, I think there was a chapter about multi-robot exploration. Yes, that's correct. Actually, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there should be a few work. So yeah, the, the patrolling one I mentioned was definitely not exploring, but could be interesting. We also did that seven cents some work on exploration, but that was on the single robot in the presence of dynamics. But nothing to, no paper to paste, unfortunately. 
Um, I guess I have a last question. Uh, so it's probably naive. I don't have any background whatsoever on SLAM, but uh, as I understand, you have two objectives, which is uh, localization and mapping. And my question is, are there any situation where these two objectives are in conflict? Like uh, you can either get a better localization and a worse map or the other way around. Or is it not the case? And whenever you have a better map, you also have a better localization. Hmm. Actually, so maybe this, <laughs> uh, just, that's a very interesting question. Um, so there is, there is a situation where going, so uh, I mentioned one of the, 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 the sequences in the ICL NUIM data set that's actually quite tricky. Um, so you can have situations where the environment is such that it's quite difficult um, to localize against. So if you, if you try and go in and, uh, and improve that map, you will definitely cause difficulties in your localization. So if you see a flat white wall, and that's mm. all that takes up your sensor. So, so if you know there's a flat white wall around the corner and you need to map it, well then, you know, you might uh, go into a, a death spiral in your algorithm if you, if you try and do that. But I don't know if that's exactly uh, what, I think your question is a bit deeper than that, to be honest, but. Um, what would happen in cases where you have dynamic objects in the scene? Uh, would you still have, wouldn't you, wouldn't you have problems with uh, the mapping then? Yes, uh, so so it, it assumes a static environment, but a lot. So there's kind of um, it's not a lot of slam systems is just assume a static environment and then they treat uh, motion as kind of outliers in the in the optimization process. Um, I think that's like essentially um, the case in 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 the Elastic Fusion algorithm as well. Um, so I think so. Obviously, you know, if 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 you put your hand in front of a camera and move it slowly, um. Where you're taking up the whole field of view of the camera, well, then the camera has to assume that it's moving slowly in the opposite direction, uh, you know, relative to whatever was in the field of view beforehand. Hmm. I have one last question from my side, for John. So, oh, okay. if you would be to use this collaborative mapping system online, would you then transmit the images directly to the server? Or would that be then a compressed representation? Um, so at the moment, what we're doing is transmitting them directly to the server. Mm -hmm. So because we're, we're just using the um, uh, the approach that I said, the Elastic Fusion approach, uh, Elastic Fusion algorithm in its kind of vanilla form underneath. Um, so we're not building the maps locally and then transmitting those because again, our initial use case was one which would support that. However, um, this workshop and even just having to prepare a talk for it has gotten us to thinking quite a lot about it. And in actual fact, your own SegMap work. So we, so we have some people who are looking at place recognition at the moment. So we've seen a lot of uh, the SegMap stuff. And I think that's, you know, and also, you know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Andy Davison's Code Slam work where they're, you know, mm -hmm. doing Slam on, on you know, so all of this idea of, of, of compressed um, uh, work, representations, I think it's very interesting. And it's something that definitely we would like to look at, um, you know, so, so, uh, but at the moment it's, it's a kind of a, a bit of a brute force approach. Mm -hmm. uh, or unelegant, maybe we should say. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, I guess, do you have a single process or is that multi-threading and you have locks on the, on the e Elastic Fusion framework? So, um, about this now, probably getting into the details that I would need to almost defer to Louis. So there's the, because it's running on a GPU, um, what we can do is we can load up each of the images that come in onto the GPU, but each, it's, it's, it's fairly much a single threaded pipeline for the fusion process. So we do, each, each image is handled um, uh, one after the other in that sense. Yeah, so I suppose you could say yeah, it would be single threaded from that point of view. Um, so we can we can handle obviously things like they're receiving the images and and uh, unpacking them and things like that, but but the actual mapping process itself is single threaded. Mm -hmm. Yep. Makes sense. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the last speaker. Uh, is Jan Ramon here? Yep. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, 
So Ravi, yeah, just go ahead with your question. Unless there's someone else who wants to ask the question. Okay, go ahead at least with the first one. Uh, so in slide 22, where we're presenting uh, estimation of statistics that were done on a network of cars and the statistics were regrouped in a hierarchical way on a tree. Uh, so, and I'm sorry, it's not the statistics, it was actually the gradients that were evaluated on models locally on each of these cars. Uh, how would you decide a global batch size when, when all of them get aggregated in the final aggregation step? Uh, so, so, so there are a lot of parameters here to consider. And so this is not something which has already been tried on cars. So it's a bit hard to, to, to make very definite statements on concrete parameters. So the idea to work in a tree is in fact an idea which has been uh, researched in the field of distributed systems where um, people research ways to organize nodes in a network so that they can collaborate together efficiently. Uh, for example, they make an overlay which is a tree shaped so that uh, if all nodes stay always online and never fail, this is extremely efficient. The only problem here is, as I explain on this slide, that for vehicles, probably this is not a very realistic and reliable solution. Mm -hmm. So if everything works nicely, you could just take a tree with a branching factor of two or something, and this would allow you to quite efficiently um, propagate also quite small batch uh, sizes upwards towards the server because you can easily aggregate underway so that no node in the network gets out of work. Mm. Um, however, in practice, this is much different since vehicles can get offline, they can drive in a region which is poorly connected or whatever. Eh? So, um, which is why I discussed after this slide uh, methods which are more randomized, so, so where in a decentralized way you propagate information without directing it immediately towards the server, but uh, try to um, spread the risks so that the failure of one single node not immediately has a huge effect on uh, the collection of uh, statistics of aggre aggregated gradients in this case. I'm not sure whether this answers your question, but... No, no, it's clear. Yeah. Um, I have one question. So uh, you mentioned about uh, learning local and uh, global models with, with the example of uh, the roundabout sign. Um, so I was wondering uh, if we have uh, perception systems uh, which are learned locally, so the backbone, uh, they often uh, learn features uh, across different classes. So when we are doing the updates, uh, won't the global model kind of get polluted with also these, uh, uh, let's say, not relevant uh, class feature information? Uh, well, um, I tried to provide this uh, roundabout sign uh, example because it is an easy example. I can find lots of examples on the internet, but this is a cl quite clear case. Probably there the solution is to just hard code uh, the borders of every country and to say, okay, in this country you have a different set of signs than in this other country. That's relatively easy to do. Another thing uh, is, but there are also a lot of uh, patterns which are local but are much harder to define uh, where they exactly apply. For example, there are a lot of features of uh, what your camera sees that depend on the climate, on the, the weather, the, the uh, let's say the, the, the things which are hard to uh, hard code in advance where it applies. And then you have 
a need for, well, the decentralized algorithm could be one possible strategy to dynamically cause the model to evolve locally. And if cars locally send messages to each other and update their models locally, to learn the pattern only locally and not propagate it further. And okay, if it's propagated further, the uh, amount of information flowing to other communities is smaller than the intensity of the information flows inside a particular region normally. Of mm -hmm. course, um, depending on how critical the feature is, you, you will need to, to have a kind of server that uh, coordinates things a bit and ensures that uh, uh, models get, don't get polluted by features f further away. But typically, um, uh, your first goal is to, to have a model being able to handle an as diverse set of features as possible. And then, okay, the problem only occurs when a feature is ambiguous, which means that in one place it means something different than in some other place, because and then indeed you can get pollution if the information travels from the one place to the other place. But mm -hmm. good, you need some coordination. But what I wanted to illustrate here is just that uh, decentralized learning where you pass messages or information or infor uh, model pieces uh, or updates to nearby places. Uh, this is something which you naturally can do. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from others? So actually, I had a question for Renan um, about the um, SIGMAP approach. Um, so it was already asked about dynamics in the environment and um, the when you're building the descriptors for the segments, uh, um, you were saying that it assumes a static environment. I'm just wondering, have you a sense of how much the actual static environment is influencing the the recognition versus because I imagine things like cars, etc., are going to have a lot of geometry associated with them. And I, 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 it's kind of two questions. One is, I suppose you could run a semantic segmentation network on the front and then try and remove points from the point cloud that 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 are going to be from items that you know could move over time, and then just try and recognize on the actual stack environment. Or, or have, have you looked at that at all, or have you any sense of? what the influence of um, the different aspects of the scene are on the classification accuracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super hard to say how, how much dynamics we can actually handle. What we did with this work, so as I said, with this descriptor, we do localization, um, reconstruction, and also semantics. So what yeah, we ended up yeah. doing is that when we, you classify a segment as a car, we don't use it for localization. Oh, sorry, I, yeah, I missed that. It's a byproduct. Let's say, um, but yeah, we also did some more work at Seven Sense on dynamics detection, where you would directly from the raw point cloud try to filter out dynamics, and then you could use the remainings for the localization. That would be one option. Um, and and at the moment, your architecture uses a, a volumetric representation at the at the input. So, and there's been kind of a lot of stuff done around processing directly on point clouds with things like point net and yeah, so bilateral convolution layers. And mm -hmm. So we're using simple 3D conv layers. I know that Maurice Fallon, they basically did something very similar using a point, is it point net or X, X was, conv was, operators. Okay, that was on the LiDAR stuff. Is that the, the LiDAR paper? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's, yeah, I mean, okay. it's very, very similar to Sigma okay. using yeah, a yeah. new different descriptor. And they showed yeah. that this could actually run on CPU, so it looked to be quite efficient. So definitely okay. something to consider there. Because in the end, I mean, these voxel grids are mostly empty. Yeah, that's what I was thinking in terms of like the expressive kind of the information content in the voxel model 
maybe there's a way of getting a more um, information rich representation coming into the network. But then again, if, if the recognition rates are running, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Maybe I don't know. So yeah, yeah, I if it works. Exactly. And there was also quite a bit of engineering going into how to align this voxel grid on the point cloud. Because right. ac according to the point of view, you might have on segments some alignment, like if the robots come from different directions, <laughs> the alignment has a huge impact on the descriptor. So that's Perfect. why. I, I think that's one of the things, the nice things about um, PointNet, it has this kind of a, they call it the T, T network, or they have a, a transformation network, a transformer network at the beginning that tries to put things into a canonical pose before it goes through these multi-layer perceptions to build its its um, compact descriptor. So there's some, mm -hmm. there's, it seems there's some nice ideas there, I think. Absolutely, yeah. So, so I had like one quick last question for Jan. Uh, I mean, this is quite naive and maybe it's just a superficial observation. Uh, the fact that you showed trees or hierarchies uh, made me think of uh, directed acyclic graphs. Uh, so is there any relationship uh, with the work you do and probabilistic graphical models? Because I imagine at each node we can have a joint distribution uh, of the label and the input, or even just a distribution of the statistics that you calculate. And once you group these nodes, I, I don't know if this is in intuitive or reasonable as a question. So, so for trees, you again refer to slide 22. Let's see. Uh, is, uh, are the trees the ones on slide 22 or are you asking about other trees? So I'm um, on slide 22, yes. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, no, I, I, the only idea here about trees is that um, you could say, okay, on slide 21, there is this uh, picture where you say, okay, everybody sends its contribution to a server, but then if you have a lot of contributions, the server gets very busy because everybody gives very small updates of the model to the server, and this is a lot of and flowing updates to the server. You can say, okay, good, we can streamline the communication of the network a bit by um, doing this in a structured way. A tree is one of the several ways to do this. This is deterministic. If all nodes stay online and never fail, this is very efficient, but this is only one of the possibilities. In fact, you can see this a bit as um, so, uh, what happens in the reverse direction with things such as BitTorrent? Eh? And so there you have a file you want to, uh, many people want to download the file. And so you copy the file to other places in the internet. And then from there on, you copy it further and you get a tree shaped uh, communication where the information spreads of the internet. So here we have a lot of information spread out and we want to centralize it and aggregate it. And again, we use here a tree-shaped structure. If nodes are likely to fail, as in our case, if you want to do this deterministic thing, uh, this will cause problems. So we may want to at least build in some redundancy, maybe not use a tree, but uh, have with higher connectivity or as I explained from slide 23 onwards uh, some uh, information propagation strategy which does not depend on a predefined organization which should anyway change over time as vehicles join the system or leave the system and there's a constant evolution in fact. Um, so, so this is mainly the structure of organization and how you communicate, not so much of what you exactly communicate. So here you communicate gradients or you collect statistics, which all fits in the two-step framework of first collecting statistics, and they could be gradients or whatever, and then you update your model each time. Thank you. So 
So are there any other questions? Uh, so I guess we can we can conclude the workshop. So I guess we are still in time. And unless if you have other questions, you can always uh, write to us. Maybe a few announcements. Uh, so we can go back here. Uh, there was just one thing I wanted to add. Uh, so on the website of the workshop, uh, which is here, we sh we shall add we shall add the videos of the talk from this workshop online. They are already on YouTube. They are just private and unlisted. Uh, we need the conference to finish, uh, after which we can upload this as a public playlist. And the second thing I wanted to add was uh, we have a useful information tab on the website, which contains the past workshops on federated learning and decentralized learning. And it's actually focused more on federated learning. And there would be upcoming workshops that I would add here. That's it. Uh, do you want to add anything, Naveen? Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. So thank you uh, to all the speakers. I think uh, I enjoyed all the talks and learned uh, like the different aspects uh, in collaborative perception, mapping, SLAM. I think that was going on very well. And um, yeah, the federated learning aspect itself. Um, and thank you to all the attendees for joining from different time zones. Uh, and for asking some nice questions. Um, yeah, hopefully we continue this uh, series even in the other conferences because this is more like an emerging uh, technology also in autonomous driving. So yeah, we hopefully will see you in other conferences as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks thank you. That was interesting. Nice to meet you all. Have a good day. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye.